you, everyone, and good morning. Um, thank you to the Rancho Mirage Writers Festival for having us here, for you all in the audience for being here. Um, Cassidy had the chance to be on the stage yesterday and answer questions from Ari Melver. And our idea here, and my idea, was to really do a little bit more of the personal side and the personal journey of you and who you are and this extraordinary um, and <laughs> what was pretty brutal coming of age story in Washington, DC. It's a cautionary tale. <laughs> Um, but ultimately an inspirational one, I think. And I know, because it's been inspiring for me as I, you know. Um, so we all know the public came to know you through your testimony for the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. <clears throat> but it, it wasn't until about a year after that testimony that you were able to to begin writing your story and to telling your, your full story publicly. And so I'd like to start from the beginning. You're a Jersey girl. <laughs> Jersey strong. <laughs> um, tell, uh, tell me and the audience uh, about growing up in New Jersey with a mom and dad who split when you were in fifth grade, um, a younger brother. You were born in your home. So was your brother. Oh yeah, was, both of us were born. You were both home birth. Uh, and your brother was born just before 9-11. Um, what was it like growing up in New Jersey? Tell us about your parents, your background, how you're growing up was. Um, so thank you for the warm introduction and thank you all for being here this morning and to Rancho Mirage for graciously hosting myself and well, both of us. Um, this is an incredible event and I'm really grateful to be here to speak with you all about the book in this moment and how we can all come together moving forward. Um, so like we just said, I did grow up in New Jersey. My parents split when I was in fifth grade. Um, came from very humble beginnings though. My father, my biological father owned and worked a landscaping company and my mom helped him run the company. We didn't have a ton of money, but they worked really hard. Um, and that was something that I I'm grateful that I witnessed from a young age and throughout my childhood. You know, it wasn't always easy or the best. Um, you know, we went through tough times, but you know, I, I think about my upbringing in relation to my experience working in the White House. And in some ways, I felt as I was an employee at the White House that I wasn't exactly the perfect fit in some ways. It, it, my biological father was very anti-government, very kind of a doomsday planner in some ways, um, which is all, there are a lot of people like that, but I grew up with this perception of the government and public service while also feeling this pull and drive to go into public service myself. So it wasn't in really until the 2012 presidential election um, when it was Obama and Mitt Romney, when I first started watching the debates. And it was almost like something, in me, it just clicked for me. And I had this vague idea of public service growing up. And then I watched the debates and I didn't know exactly how I could go into politics, but the Republican Party message made sense to me. And I felt that it aligned with my ideals largely and how I perceive the world growing up through the lens in which that I was experiencing the world at the time. And that really motivated me to go forward and through with college and then eventually to Washington. So. Well, and, and you have an amazing story because of how you got to college, but I wanna just put a pin in a story you tell in your book that was formative for you. you. I mean, you talk about how it was really 2012 where it all clicked, but it was clearly percolating before then. And you had a member of your family, it was sort of in your greater family, that served in Iraq and Afghanistan. And, and you, you describe a scene where you went to the hangar when he was returning from combat. And the sort of the glory of seeing the soldiers returning home and being reunited with their families and receiving your first American flag pin. Was, Can you tell that story? Yeah, uh, thank you for bringing that up. So my Uncle Joe was the first figure that I really had in my life that was a public servant. He lived in Indiana, but my aunt started dating him, and he just was this 
extremely courageous and remarkable person to me from a very young age and very nurturing in, in a way that my biological father wasn't. So it was really difficult for me when he went and fought in the war, but I also knew because he had talked to me about this, how important it was for the country that he was willing to lay down his life and sacrifice for the country in that way. So when he came home, I mean, I, I like, I remember waiting weeks for this, and we, my mom, brother, and I drove out to Indiana, and we're in this airplane hangar, and it's so hot. It's the middle of August, and we're just waiting, waiting, waiting all day. And slowly, the airplane hangar door starts going up, and you see the soldiers march in. I have goosebumps thinking about this, because it's just this really powerful moment in my life and in my history and memories, but also in what has been ingrained in our society since our founding, and that's immense national pride, especially for the people who are willing to lay down their lives for our country and for our citizens and constituents. And right now, you know, I think in my view and how I've experienced a lot of this, we, we need to return to some of those ideals. I think that being a, a citizen of this country is the highest honor that we all can have. But it's incumbent upon all of us to continue to work to make America great. We can't just rely on our military and our soldiers, we all have to be participants in our democracy. Um, you, you, you got yourself to college against, I think, a lot of strong forces that were compelling you to make other choices, but you were, you were, you were determined. Gracious. <laughs> uh, and, and extraordinarily, methodically, worked your way through a series of internships on Capitol Hill on the House side, on the Senate side, eventually to the White House, and became an enormously valuable member of the White House ultimately because you understood the Congress. And so talk, to, just ex explain, um, <laughs> I mean, your, your drive and your dedication to sort of being committed to a course uh, of, of developing yourself into a c competitive political resume is, is pretty remarkable, and it's something I didn't understand about you until I read your book. I think it's something I'm still trying to understand about myself, too. Um, no, my, and from a very young age, my biological father, you know, we have a very strained relationship now. I'm very grateful for you know, what we had growing up and the lessons that I have learned from him. But he ingrained in me from a very young age that education was a, the ticket out. Education, I had to go to college. And he wasn't saying that we lived a bad life, but he wanted a better life for me and for my brother. So I wanted to go to college. My mom was sort of a little bit more indifferent about it, which is also completely okay. But uh, I, I knew that I, in order to, you know, sort of get out of this systemic patterns that I had found myself in and just sort of wanting a better life, I, I had to go to school and I wanted to pursue a career in politics. Um, so I knew when I was applying to Capitol Hill internships, it was, maybe going to be a little bit more, more difficult. You know, I was applying to Republican offices and you normally, it, Capitol Hill interns, for those that don't know, typically work for their, uh, their home representative. New Jersey doesn't have many Republicans or they didn't at the time. Uh, so I blasted my resume out to every single House Republican office and I got five interviews and accepted an internship with then Majority Whip Steve Scalise in 2017. So all of this coalesced with Trump coming to, to office and becoming president in the first 100 days of his, of his administration. Um, you were with Steve Scalise's office when he was shot on the baseball field. He, um, you went through this entire experience, Steve Scalise as the whip, the number three in seniority in the House of Representatives at the time, had access to every single member and you developed personal relationships with hundreds of members of Congress that ultimately served you when you got to the White House. Right, and I think that that's, you know, I used to say I was in the right place at the right time. I don't know if it was the wrong place, wrong time, or wrong place, right time anymore, but uh, he, correct. He, so the, the WIP does member services, so I was able to form relationships, one-on-one -on -one relationships, not only with staff, but with the members themselves. Eventually went to the White House, got an internship in the Office of Legislative Affairs, which I think is one of the most important offices. It is essentially the bridge between the executive branch and the legislative branch. So without a really strong OLA office, you don't have a fluid system of communication within the government. 
I worked for the house team and that's where I really started to more deeply develop relationships with members of leadership such as former Congressman Kevin McCarthy, uh, eventually Mark Meadows, who I ended up working for when he was the chief of staff. Um, well, you developed a, a strong relationship with Mark Meadows, who essentially cultivated you, knowing, not in a creepy way, but well, maybe, maybe well, I'll let you speak to the nature of how, how that relationship developed, but ultimately, he spotted you as a highly talented, highly effective, hardworking staffer, and the second he was asked to be chief of staff, he reached out to you and brought you in. So you end up becoming, essentially, the chief of staff to the chief of staff of the White House when you are... 23 years old? I just turned 23. So it's an, an amazingly uh, robust, powerful position chocked with responsibility. Um, and it's, how, did, how did you feel about that then? Did you, did you ever have imposter syndrome or pinch yourself or just think, oh my god, I'm, my office is next to the Oval Office in the White House? You know, I, I did have moments like that, but what I think made me effective partially in that role was the fact that I was able to look at people as people and I was there to do a job and to get the job done. So I was able to sort of put up a blinder which also did not serve me well because I was very blissfully naive in some ways and very ignorant in other ways to a lot of the more treacherous things that were happening within the administration. But tell us about what that job was. Like what, what did the job entail? Uh, I mean it was sort of a little bit of everything. I was the way that Mark had originally described the job to me was I was his eyes and ears in the West Wing. So he wanted me to travel with him and the president. He wanted us to be seen together. He wanted to make sure that people knew that I was a stable conduit to Mark Meadows. So whether it was cabinet secretaries or their staffs, members of Congress, senators, he wanted me to be an access point to get to him. But I think that every chief of staff deserves to have a strong staff below them to serve them well, because ultimately they're there to serve the president of the United States. Um, you and felt I really some enjoyed. I, I enjoyed my role with Mark, and I I would be doing a disservice to myself and to Mark if I didn't acknowledge that, because I the only reason that I'm well, there's several reasons I'm here today. But the reason I'm largely here today is because he gave me the opportunity and he empowered me in ways that a lot of bosses wouldn't at a young age. And whether or not that's a benefit or a strength or a weakness. Uh, Respectfully, I'm going to disagree. <laughs> um, the reason you're here today is because of bold actions you took as an individual with a deep reservoir of courage in a very difficult <laughs> moment for our country. Um, because if you hadn't, you wouldn't be here today. But I don't. I, don't but, but I, don't, I, I, I wanted to say, like, he, he did empower me. And I, he, I, yeah. he did, and increasingly, and I, I want to spend just a beat on that because. Maybe he had good judge of characters. So hopefully. <laughs> good Southern Baptist often does, right? <laughs> um, but I, but I want to just spend a beat on what it was like to work for Mark Meadows because you write in your book you had some hesitations about go, working for him initially. I mean, you, you had been in the Office of Legislative Affairs and you thought, oh my gosh, do I really want to take this promotion to become a special assistant to the president and the chief of staff of the chief of staff of the... And uh, he increasingly became so comfortable with you that he would not go on presidential trips. He would send you on his own. You, you acted literally in his steed after not very much time at all. So... Um, oh, about seven months. <laughs> seven months. Is, so, I mean... Why did you initially have hesitations working with him? And was there ever a tension that you felt, and I'm feeding you here because I read this in your book, you talk about feeling a tension about whether you felt um, loyal to Mark or to the president and sort of serving the country. So can you talk about that? Yeah, I'm happy you mentioned that because when I entered public service, I had this concept of who I wanted to become. And it was based off of the great leaders of our past, you know, from our first presidents to Abraham Lincoln, to John McCain, to Mitt Romney. So I was looking, and again, at the time, through a very Republican lens, and I admit that. But I entered public service wanting to become someone that would lay down their life for the country. And that's, you know, I believe that when you swear an oath to the country, you, you swear that oath, you, you are to uphold that. And it sort of is sad that we've divulged so far from that as a society where it's seen as courageous to come forward and honor that oath. And you know, I think that that's an unfortunate aspect of what we're experiencing right now. 
But to go back to what you were uh, saying about working with Mark. Um, Did you feel a tension between your loyalty to him yes, and the, that of, to your job? Yes, and that's where I had, I, was, I didn't do a lot of self-reflection in that job. And when I took the job with Mark, I was very clear with him that I wanted to work for Mark Meadows as the chief of staff, not Mark Meadows as Mark Meadows. And to me, there was a very important distinction there. I was there to serve the office of the chief of staff of the White House, not the individual. And you had some hesitation. I did, I did have, yeah, I, I did have hesitations taking that job because I, you know, I, COVID was just sort of getting started. I was well positioned in the Office of Legislative Affairs, but also the first impeachment had just ended. There was an election coming up. I was a little concerned about job security, so I started putting out soft feelers on the Hill. Um, but throughout my tenure with, the, with Mark and working for the president, I did become inured to the the political rhetoric that was prevalent throughout the administration. And it was unfortunate that that happened and I did feel this conflicting sense of loyalty and I didn't do a lot of reflection at the time to understand that the conflict within me wasn't that I was necessarily disloyal to the country but it was some, in my view, some of the people I was working for, including the former president of the United States, Mr. Trump, they weren't loyal to the country. And I was in a position where I wasn't, you know, we were going a million miles you're, an hour You're not, it, it, unless you've worked in, in so those offices in the White House, it's hard to understand how, I mean, you're describing 16, 18, 20 hour days repeatedly, you're getting During no sleep. During the global pandemic, uh, then we had the summer of civil unrest after George Floyd was murdered. We're in the midst of a, an election cycle. So. An election cycle. So you have no time to sleep. You, you're living on basically Red Bull coffee and protein bars. My, and, my health had declined a little bit. And so there isn't, I mean, I, I, I certainly understand that experience, um, not having worked in the White House. Chief of but having worked in the White House during the Katrina incident under George W. Bush, it's, you don't have time to think. You're just trying to get your do the job and complete your responsibilities, um, and you reflect later, which is clearly what you've done. But there's just two stories that I think are so funny from your experience in the White House. One of them is about your boss, Mark Meadows, who um, is a total teetotaler. He's a Southern Baptist. He doesn't drink, and um, you come into the office one morning on a Monday at 10 a.m., and there are three white claws on his desk. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? Girls, <laughs> these have alcohol in them, don't they? <laughs> this is what he says to you. The chief White House chief so of staff on the Monday morning says, girls, do these have alcohol in them? So this, after the election, Mark and I, we were on the campaign trail. We both came down with the coronavirus. So we had been out for about 10 days after the election. So this, this was our first day back. The election night, I, I guess there had been, I wasn't there election night because I had the coronavirus, but I guess there had been a little bit of party festivities in the West Wing and there had been some White Claws stored in his refrigerator. Now what a lot of people don't know is he doesn't drink flat water, he only drinks sparkling water. So he grabbed out the White Claws, which are alcohol. Which they say sparkling on the can. <laughs> and not realizing that they, I think, are 5% alcohol. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't drink, so. So he had to take some time to sober up before the president came down that morning. Um, <laughs> you know, I like to think that maybe he just wanted to indulge in a little stress relief. <laughs> but but it, it was truly innocent. Um, there's also, I mean, you spent so much time traveling on the campaign, going um, ahead of the president's entourage to ensure that the, eventually you went, started going ahead to ensure that the crowd size was proper and the, the, all the advance work had been done to the president's specifications. Um, and there's a moment you describe, because you have choice words about Mark Meadows now, and I know they're complicated, because you also felt very loyal and devoted to him, and you describe one episode in the book that I think shows how much, um, shows him in a more nuanced way, I think. Um, you're in North Carolina at a major rally, and you spot a little girl being held up by her father, and m trying to get Mark's attention, because Mark is one of the celebrities at these Trump rallies, and Mark is just not seeing her, and the girl starts to cry. So what happened? Yeah, so we're in his uh, home state, and I grabbed Mark, and I pointed at the little girl, and I told him that he needed to go over, and he was, he was going to ruin her day or her life if he didn't go over and say hello to her. So he sent me back to the staff tent to get a bunch of little gifts, including an American flag pin. 
And by the time I had returned, oh gosh, I have goosebumps right now. But by the time I had returned, they were in the overflow section of the rally crowd. So they were only looking at the rally on jumbotrons. Mark had pulled a little girl over the security fencing and was crouching down talking to her. So I slipped him all the gifts and she, she was so happy. And I was talking to her father and he was telling me that he had worked night shift and his daughter wanted to go to this rally so bad. And this was a rally that we had rescheduled due to inclement weather. And he, had, you know, he worked the night shift, but he had taken her. And he was so emotional that Mark had taken the time to talk to his daughter about you know, what he had brought his daughter to, there to see that day, which is what he thought was democracy in action and our constitutional republic working and our election system working. And it's a really powerful but also sober moment for me to look back on because on one hand, it's a really human and real moment for Mark. You know, these, not everything was bad. And I think that's really important to remember, especially as we enter this election year. We're all people at the end of the day. And he is and was, he was and maybe is still a public servant. And he, he did care and he wanted to pass on that sense of patriotism to her. And it meant a lot to me in that moment. But I reflect on that now and I think about what I've gone through and just this period of, of reflection for me in my experience of working for Mr. Trump, but also with my upbringing and the falling out, which I'm sure we'll get into. But I think about all this and I just think about the carnage that lays around Donald Trump, whether it's the people that vote for him or donate, send small dollar donations for him to him and essentially they're just paying his legal bills. I think about all of the staff and lawyers that he has exploited over the years for his own personal self gain. And it makes me really sad that he has been so effective at deceiving such a massive portion of the American population because Americans deserve better, our future generations deserve better, and our future generations of women and little girls deserve better. And we need stable leadership to, to ensure that. that can One of the things that I know um, we've talked about this, you've mentioned um, that it's, as you came out of it, right, after you testified, as you had lawyers um, sort of really help you through um, your first round of testimony and then moving on, and I, I, we'll get to that. Um, somebody said something to you about how, yeah, you're being, you're being deprogrammed because, you know, and reference this notion of a, of a cult, um, which struck you deeply uncomfortably. But how have you come to think about all those people who believe in, in that, Don, that this notion that Donald Trump is fighting for them? Yeah, you know, it's the, the cult reference was really difficult for me. And yeah, it's, I don't want to be erroneous with categ blanket categorizing Donald Trump or the MAGA movement as a cult, but it is a very cult-like movement. And I'm not a cult expert, but I have done some research since, and there are a lot of parallels, especially with my experience of leading and then coming to terms with what I actually was a part of. And I think it's really, really critical to remember, or at least to keep in mind, that when we talk to people, you know, I think that sometimes as a society, and I, I experienced this where I was very, very fearful of making that break with the Trump world when I had wanted to and I felt compelled to because I had a constitutional responsibility and a moral obligation to do so. But I was really afraid. I was afraid of being completely ostracized by my tribe, the Republican Party, which I had been a part of. That was where all of my social and professional circles were formed. And I was also really afraid of being completely chastised and ousted by the left because I had made poor choices. I had been part of something that was dangerous and wrong. And I felt isolated. And you know, I think when we talk to people, we need to come from a perspective that when you're in a situation like that, and it's really difficult to put into words and to explain if you haven't experienced it yourself, but I was viewing the world through this very singular lens. And when I felt at the time when people started talking to me about, you know, maybe you should start thinking about the, Cult deprogramming, or at least thinking in that way, or doing some research, but I made me almost dig my heels in harder because I. You redouble your defenses. Nobody that wants to be told they're in a cult, or nobody that is that is a part of something dangerous wants to be told they're part of something dangerous. I think that we need to approach conversations from an educa educational perspective, 
and also to make sure that people are being heard and listened to and to approach things as, you know, I want to hear your point of view, but this is mine. And, you know, this is a, would be a slow progress. But in order to get out from this moment, we have to get through this moment. And I think that we have to, as a society, practice a little bit more empathy and understanding for the people that have been seduced and sucked into Donald Trump's sanctum and his movement irrationally and false, falsely because he has built this movement off of fear and propaganda and lies. And that's how authoritarians rise to power. And that is what we're on the brink of right now. And I'm, you know, I'm not here to fear monger, but that, that is the reality. And as Americans, I think that we are extremely fortunate where we haven't had a scenario like we have seen in other countries where they've had a democracy and then it's been taken away from them. But it can happen really fast, and it almost did. And we're on the precipice of that, of that happen happening again. Um, you uh, beautifully said, um, we know how you felt about January 6th um, with limited time. If you, if you want to hear the tick, if you read the TikTok or the line by line, please buy her book and read it. It is such a compelling, compelling testimony to your journey. Um, you go through January 6th. You um, ultimately realize that you're about to receive a subpoena after the January 6th committee is formed. And you find yourself in golden handcuffs because there is no way that you, having worked for the federal government for the previous four years, have any um, resources to pay for legal bills. But enter, enter your hero, um, the Trump campaign, or, or someone associated with Trump world. Um, volunteers to pay for your legal fees, and you participate half-heartedly and not holistically um, until you, you realize um, that you actually do want to be wholly forthcoming and you want a second chance. Um, you tell a story about your friend Sam, um, who I believe is a member of Congress. We shall pr protect his identity since. He's uh, a, a current member of Congress um, still too. Uh, encourages you to go look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. And not look at how you look, but look at whether you can live with yourself. Um, and, and somehow that precipitated you going full force in the other direction. Yeah, it's that night uh, the January 6th committee had filed, um, had submitted a lawsuit or something against Meadows, Mark Meadows, where several pages of my testimony, first few sessions of my testimony had been uh, published. And I'm reading through the transcripts, and it was just this really powerful but also extremely frightening moment for me because I, I had that concept of who I wanted to become when I entered public service. And I, in that moment, hit me like a train, how far gone I was from that person. And again, I felt this really compelling moral obligation and constitutional responsibility to uphold my oath of office, but also to do the right thing and to come forward and tell the whole truth and to tell everything that I, that I knew. So I called Sam, and uh, who is a current Republican member of Congress who did not serve on the January 6th committee, and he, he told me to go look in the mirror. And like you just said, he asked if I could live with myself for the rest of my life. And it sort of at the time seemed like this really silly and sort of idiotic thought experiment. And I also was crying. I don't like to look at myself when I'm crying. As I just was very emotional in this moment. But it was just this remarkable full circle moment for me that I look back on now. There are a lot of moments that changed the, tra the trajectory of my life. But that really was one where I, for the first time, felt empowered by someone that it was okay to go forward and do the right thing. And this was someone that I had worked with in the past and I had known from my time in the administration who was still serving in Congress and who is and was a responsible member of Congress throughout his, the tenure that I worked with him and continues to be so. Um, but it's also really important to remember that that's not reflective of the entire Congress. And I think that we need to work to elect more people like that of moral integrity. And it's not that I have to, I feel compelled to protect his identity because I don't want there to be civil unrest or public or political violence unleashed on him and his family. And that's just the era that we're living in. And that's what Donald Trump has normalized. Um. So PSA, there are Republicans in Congress currently serving that are afraid for their own safety and will not stand up to Donald Trump, but are important in your view to be there because when the rubber hits the road, do you think Sam will vote for certification 
when it comes around next time or not. I mean, this is, to me, I think, there are several Republicans who voted for certification, but a lot of them have left. And that's, I mean, when the rubber hits the road next is, if it's Trump v. Biden, and there's an electoral dispute, which Republicans are going to join with Democrats to certify? Well, look, and I think that's a really important point in speaking about the 2024 election. In my view right now, one of the, you know, Donald Trump is an existential crisis to our constitutional republic and to our democracy and to our stability as a free nation on the world stage. It is absolutely essential that he is never anywhere near the Oval Office again. But second on that priority list for me is making sure that we elect responsible and trustworthy people to Congress. And right now, the Republican Party, as I have perceived it, is not in a place where they're going to elect responsible people to Congress. And there is a very good chance that this next election could be contested again. You know, I think that when we approach this election, it's equally important to talk about Congress and, you know, I have not voted for Democrats in my life. I consider myself a, a very moderate Republican. I have more conservative personal principles, but I don't necessarily think that my personal conservative principles are what should be the lay of the land. Um, but I would vote for Democrats across the board in this next election if that meant that Donald Trump and Republicans in Congress don't have the ability to uproot and shred our constitution like they almost did in 2020. Um, okay, this is my favorite part of the book that I didn't know about you. You, in, you get to this point in your journey where you decide you're gonna move forward with new legal counsel with, um, and, and you're gonna testify, you're gonna go back, and you're gonna t spill the beans, you're gonna tell everything. Um, and part of what led you to this discovery is a man, and I'd like to see a show of hands in the room for people who recognize the name and understand the importance of Alexander Butterfield. Okay. So Alexander Butterfield, you discover, okay, to remind people, Alexander Butterfield is the Deputy Chief of Staff to the White House Chief of Staff, um, Hadelman, and he is the, Haldeman, and he is the individual who immediately going into the Watergate hearings discloses that there are tapes of the White House. How did you discover Haldeman, and how did you, I'm sorry, not Haldeman, Butterfield, and how did you feel <laughs> an instant connection with him? Uh, so this was after my conversation with Sam, and a couple days after, and I had begun the process of back-channeling to the January 6th committee to go in for a third deposition, because at the time I was thinking, you know, if I can still get through this, I could, maybe I could just get through it unscathed. No, that didn't, obviously that didn't unscathed. happen. But, uh, so I'm, I'm driving up to New Jersey one night, and I'm thinking there had to be somebody in the Nixon White House that had a similar role or position to what I had, a role that required an incredible, incredible amount of trust and in, an incredible amount of you know, the ability to keep things to themselves and that didn't want to be in that position, but ultimately you know, did the right thing. I, just, I needed a connection with somebody that had gone through something similar. And I had, you know, I had heard of John Dean, but I was like, I was not the White House counsel. I don't know anything that would be, amount to that. And I, uh, John Dean is an incredible and honorable American, but nowhere on the same level as John Dean. So I, on the uh, Watergate investigation page, and I find Alexander Butterfield's name. So I click on it, and it's a very limited profile, so I'll automatically, I'm like, perfect. He did not try to do anything after he went forward. He did the right thing. So, already green flags all around. And then I'm starting to read about what he actually did and came forward and testified to. And I was extremely moved, not only by his story, but by his commitment to his country and by his commitment to honor his oath. And it, he didn't want to come forward to the Watergate committee, but he knew from the get-go that if he was called, he would go without question. He would go and he would tell the whole truth because he had served in the military. He had taken the oath once when he swore into the military. He had taken the oath another time when he swore to work in the White House. Uh, and then he worked at the FAA as well. And I saw in Alex a vision of the public servant that I had wanted to become and the person that I felt that I could still grasp. I, I felt that I could still kind of claw my way back. So he gave me that second wind of optimism and strength to go forward 
and to continue working with the January 6th committee, not this time too. You know, it's, this is about April of 2022, so we're not in this, what, where we are now, where we have a wealth of public resources and knowledge about what actually went, what, what actually happened that day. But it was hearing Alex's story and then eventually getting to meet Alex that, you know, for me as an American, I look back on what Alex experienced almost 50 years to the day when I testified. And I, we had a conversation about this where, you know, he never would have envisioned that 50 years later we would have been on the brink of another corrupt presidency that required people to go forward and testify truthfully. And I think about that and then 50 years down the road and anything that I can do to make sure that either that never happens again or that there's another, a future little girl or woman or even a, a man that if they feel like they're on the brink of making a really difficult moral decision, that they have someone to turn to and that they can find companionship and through storytelling or through books or through hearing my journey because you know, my journey isn't linear. I made a lot of mistakes. I did a lot of things that I wish I could take back. But it's also, in my view, a journey of self-discovery and a comeback and a grace that saved my life and being embraced by people who have inspired me to continue on the trajectory of public service and also show, also show me that there are really, really good, caring people in this world. But we have to surround ourselves with those people. Um, you write in your... I agree. You, um, you write in your acknowledgments, I cannot overstate the impact of Alexander Butterfield has had on my life. His allegiance to his oath that he swore is a reminder that the pursuit of justice is an obligation that should never waver. May his legacy continue to inspire future generations and define their moral compass in the face of adversity. Um, and that you credit that the journey wouldn't have happened without you. And Butterfield, in hindsight, said that he had no regrets if he had to do it all over again. I figure I'd do the very same thing. Where's your phone? Do you have your phone with you? I don't. It's backstage. <laughs> she showed me backstage her phone and the screensaver on her phone is a picture of her and Alexander Butterfield. <laughs> that was amazing. It was actually, I flew out to California. When did you meet him? Almost, almost a year, it might have been exactly a year ago. Is today February 2nd? Yeah. It, almost been, it might have been February 2nd last year. Uh, I Chels. Flew and I met him for the first time and I was flying in, and I remember, I've never been to San Diego, and I remember looking out the plane window and seeing all the warships, and Alex and I had talked on the phone a lot leading up to the first time we had met, and he had told me that to look out the window and we had, when the plane was landing, and I would see all of the Navy battleships, and he was so proud of all of that, and it was almost this sense when you're like, I was coming home, and, you know, Alex is, Alex has given me so much, but he has given our country so much too, and he's just, he embodies what a, a public servant is, and I'm, I'm grateful that he was around to help guide me through, and he didn't know that he was a core force for me, and that he was there when I needed him the most after. Um, we don't have much time left, but I wanna hit on two more topics quickly. Um, Liz Cheney is also somebody who has become um, really a spiritual guidepost for you, a mentor, um, a, a person who, who you deeply treasure, relied upon, and respect and admire. One of the things Liz Cheney said um, about you and the January 6th committee hearing and your courage to come forward was that the country needs to see um, strong women and girls standing That's up. That's true. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I mean, Liz Cheney, I, she is not only an incredible public servant, but she is an incredible woman. She's an incredible leader. She's an incredible role model. I looked towards Liz Cheney when I was you know, going through this period, the year and a half after the end of the administration, as somebody who I didn't always agree with, and she irked me from time to time, but she was doing what I was jealous of, and I had wanted to do myself, and, you know, I, it's not, I wish that I had, but I'm really, I feel so fortunate that I had her example to look to. It, Liz Cheney, Adam Kinzinger, but I also think about other, Nancy Pelosi, who I worked with her and her staff during my tenure in the White House. And I, you know, I think about her, the moral leadership that she has set for, for generations of women and little girls. And if I can 
amount to a fraction of who those women are. Alyssa Fair, Griffin, Sarah Matthews, Ruby Moss, and Shay Freeman that all testified for the January 6th committee. You know, I think it, men have successfully led our country to the point that we're at now, but I do believe that our future is female, and I think that we need to build generations of strong girls. Um, I, I want to reflect on something really serious, and you've, you've alluded to it throughout all of your, your comments, but um, the, the process for you, um, as you have reflected back, you wrote um, that you reflected and you have regretted the belligerence and the cruelty and the crudity of some of the president's messaging, its inappropriateness, his unpresidential treats, tweets, communications, but that you became a nerd to it. And you speak to the power of tribalism in our politics and how it didn't just affect you and the staff in the White House, it's, it's affected the country. Um, maybe it's not a cult, but it's a movement with cult-like features. Um, and it is eroding our, our democracy and, and the institutions that have taken 250 years to build. Um, how, how can we move forward? Because w right now, we're moving forward as a, as a repeat. Um, We've essentially repeated the same election for three cycles. Yeah. There's no reason that we should be in this position right now, but we are, and we need to accept that reality. Um, you know, I, a lot of, by the way, that's not an easy thing to do. Many Republicans have not accepted that reality. Many Republicans have. The, 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 <laughs> the country at large is, is, is only beginning to wake up to the fact that we're on track for a Biden v. Trump 2.0 re-election, which is essentially the, 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 the first time in history that we'll have two incumbents facing off against each other. One the, facing, the I believe, 91 criminal and, and, charges. And, and, then, and there's that. <laughs> so. And one facing 91 criminal charges, right. Um, uh, there's not a simple formula, I don't think, to move, but, I don't know how to exactly move forward, but I think, you know, there's several. Do you ever think about what could heal the country, though, how, how we can move past this? I do. I, I think a lot about that, and I think, you know, I touched on this earlier, I think moving forward, and it's, you know, a lot of this would have to come, I believe, in my view, after the 2024 presidential election. I think that we need to devote all of our time and resources right now to making sure, you know, the election's going to come down. And, uh, we had Carl Rove here yesterday, and Carl Rove uh, could speak much better to the statistics of all of this than I could. But essentially, the election will come down to a handful of swing states and about 100,000 votes in the greatest likelihood. We need to make sure that we're devoting resources to those districts and to the American population as a whole to make sure that they're not getting constantly fed propaganda and lies. You know, that's the first big step that we need to take. We need to deconstruct this system that Donald Trump has unfortunately successfully implemented, which is building this movement based off of people's basic fears and their needs of security and what they rely on the government for. And he's exploited that fear and built a movement off of propaganda and lies in this falsehood. So we need to make sure that we're properly educating the American people about what's actually at stake. But I think really what's essential, and some of this comes now, but some of it will come down the road, is, ex is explaining to Americans how fragile democracy is and how quickly it can get taken away from us. We need to talk about how that's happened in other countries and how we are so fortunate as Americans to not have had to experience that, but it can happen really fast and societies can completely dissolve. And again, we're on the brink of that potentially happening in 2024. And it's a really, really dangerous and critical moment for our history as a nation but also for the peace and stability of the world. We have been you know, the gatekeepers of security for the world for 250 years. And what example are we setting for the world if we're going to not stick up for our democracy and what we have so cherished for so long? You know, and I, I think about all of this and I, I don't ever want to reach a point in my life where I look back again and I think, could I have done more? Could I have said something? How will I explain this to my children or my future grandchild grandchildren or future generations of leaders that I stood back when it might have been easier to remain quiet? You know, I think that when we move forward and hopefully move forward a little bit more hand in hand and to be able to have productive policy conversations, 
we've righted our wrongs and we've looked towards our better angels as, as we have in the past. Cassidy Hutchinson, for your courage, for your willingness to share and speak out and to, to be one of those pillars that stands up for our democracy in those brutal, harsh moments. Thank you for sharing with us. Yeah, thank you for thank being you. here. Thank you all. Okay.